Hey, this is Pastor Spencer with Racine Bible Church. You're listening to a sermon from a Sunday morning. Church, let us pray together. Lord Jesus, I bless your name for your blood. Without your blood, I would still be gripped by my sin and lost without hope. Lord Jesus, we bless you for shedding your blood for us, rescuing us from sin and the grave and death. And now, Lord Jesus, in the power of your blood shed at Calvary, in the power of your resurrection, I ask that you would teach me that I might teach them. Sanctify and purify my mind. Send the burning, cleansing coal from your altar to sanctify my lips that I might not speak words that are wrong, that are misleading, that are self-seeking, but that I might speak your holy, pure word that your precious, precious flock might be nourished thereby. Jesus, be glorified in the preaching of your word. Amen. As we open God's word for preaching, preaching is the passionate communication of God's revelation for the purpose of the edification and encouragement of God's church. The point of preaching is to encourage you by instructing you. The point of preaching is to encourage and enable and equip you by instructing and exhorting and teaching you. The encouragement comes through the instruction. There's a type of encouragement that's just like rah, rah, that doesn't have much content in it. That's not what preaching is. Preaching is encouragement through instruction. Because Christian encouragement requires instruction or reminder of who Christ is and what Christ has done. Because the Christian life is lived by faith. It isn't lived by feelings, so we don't merely need an encouragement that makes us feel better. The Christian life is lived by faith. And so every week we need, we, we need that faith to be strengthened. We need what we believe to be, uh, to, to grab, a, we, need, we ourselves need to grab a hold of it more with our mind and with our heart and with our feet and with our hands. So preaching isn't merely teaching and instruction because preaching is teaching or instruction for the purpose of encouragement and to, 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 to bring you to the place where your deepest beliefs and God's perfect will keep you going in the Christian life. If I could say one more thing about preaching, which will lead us to 1 Peter 3, verses, uh, let's see, verses, um, verses 18 through 22. If I could say one more thing about preaching and the way we do it here at Racine Bible is this. We preach verse by verse through books of the Bible. We do that in our ABFs. We go through Exodus, you know, paragraph by paragraph, page by page. And here in the pulpit, we've been going through 1 Peter verse by verse. And that's good. And that's also very different than the way we normally do things. Because normally, when we do things, we get to pick what we want. We were out of town. Last week, I came home. There was nothing in the house, so I had to go to the grocery store yesterday. And I just had this epiphany moment when I was getting yogurt at the grocery store. I, you, I actually had to back up so that my eyes could see. It was like from here all the way over to here, kinds of yogurt in that grocery store. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. How many different varieties. And every time you push your shopping cart, you get to pick whichever one you want. When we're virtually shopping on Amazon, you put in, you type in what you're looking for, and then like, you know, all these little boxes come up and all these options. You sort of think you're picking the one you want, but actually there are other ones, but the almighty algorithm only shows you the ones that you're likely to purchase. But still, you pick the one out of the ones that the algorithm picked for you that you want. Movies, music, we get to select. It's really, really 
good. That you're, you're not a part of a church where the primary teaching pastor just selects whatever he wants to say every week. You, you need protection from me <laughs> and my bents and my proclivities. <laughs> and it is very good for you that we go verse by verse by verse by verse because that way I can't skip what I don't want to deal with and, and you can't pick only the things that you want and it is so good for us to go verse by verse by verse. And if we weren't going verse by verse, 1 Peter 3 Verses 19 and 20 and 21 would be verses that we would probably be tempted to skip. It's not an exaggeration to say that there's a very small handful of New Testament passages that are the most difficult to interpret. And this is right there on the top of the list. It says in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. I don't actually want to skip these verses. I I think we'll see together that these verses encourage us and enable us to, to, to live the Christian life the way that we should. But one reason I would have been tempted to skip them is, you know, when when you're getting together a Bible lesson, and many of you do this for Bible study, sometimes you get what's called a commentary. And a commentary is like a thicker book, like a like a maybe a 400-page book about First Peter, which is really only like 12 pages, but it's written by an expert in the language and the grammar and the history and the context and theology, and they sort of comment on what all the different verses in First Peter mean. And one of the commentaries that I've been using uh, uh, is Wayne Grudem's. And so I was just looking, because I, I was like, this is going to take a while for me to figure these verses out. They're complicated. So I was just looking at it, and I was like, okay, uh, Wayne Grudem takes 11 pages to comment on these verses. I was like, that's not that bad. I, I can get that done. But actually, it was bad. Because at the end of those 11 pages, it says, see appendix. And he has a 49-page appendix on these verses. <laughs> so it took longer than I thought it would. But it was worth the time. And I believe that the instruction from this text will encourage and edify you. So let's figure out what this means. I think I, 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 I hope you remember that we did verses 18 and 22 last week. Because even though there are some sort of tangled up interpretive issues in the middle, the big point is very, very clear. The point is that Christ suffered past tense and is no longer suffering. Now, present tense, Christ is reigning. That's the point of the passage. Christ suffered and his suffering is over and now he reigns and we can be encouraged by that. But let's figure out what these verses mean. Let's look at verse 19 and ask the question, who are these spirits and what did Jesus do when he appeared before them? It says that Jesus was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. It says that when Jesus died on the cross, he was made alive, after that he was made alive in the spirit, and he proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, who are these spirits? I don't believe that they're the spirits of men and women, This word, as Peter uses it, refers to the spiritual forces or the spiritual angelic beings. And this is a place where we need some other verses to help us figure out what this verse means. This verse just says that these spirits were in prison, last word of verse 19, because they didn't obey, and it refers to the days of Noah, So if we look back at Genesis 6 and the days of Noah, this is how the story goes and it it explains what some spiritual beings, some angels did in the days of Noah. 
We read in Genesis 6, verse 1, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, that is the angels, saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So it's a strange story, but it's a true story that in some way these demonic angels went into um, human women to try to corrupt the line of the Messiah and the seed of the children of man on the earth. Another verse that might help us understand this verse is in Jude. You don't have to go chapters in Jude, you just go verses. Jude verse six talks about the same thing. Jude verse six says this, and the angels who did not stay within their proper position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. It's obviously a parallel text because it's spirits who are in prison and in chains. And it's also the reason that they're there is because they didn't stay in their angelic or spiritual realm, but they passed through their proper domain to try to cohabit with earthly wives. And then one more verse that might help us understand this verse is also from Peter. Second Peter, his second epistle, second Peter, chapter two, verses four and five. It says that uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell or into the prison and committed them to chains and gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And then we know it's parallel because verse 5 says, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, and he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. It seems like better than a guess that Each of these verses talks about the spirits transgressing their proper domain and now being put in prison. And so I do believe that's the best interpretation of who these spirits are. They were demons who took a special effort to ruin the seed of the promised savior, the one who was coming, Genesis 3.15, so that he couldn't fulfill his mission. But what happened is when Jesus did fulfill his mission, Then he proclaimed to these spirits, he victoriously proclaimed to these spirits that they were utterly and completely defeated. That's what this verse is talking about. It's not talking about Jesus sort of suffering in hell, being tormented in hell. It's Jesus proclaiming his victory in hell, or at least to the spirits in this special prison or chains, chained up place that they were in. Do you know the Apostles' Creed? If you grew up in a Reformed or a Lutheran church, you, you, at least you used to know the Apostles' Creed or you used to be able to say it even if you didn't know it, part of their weekly liturgy. We don't know exactly when the Apostles' Creed was written. As far as I know, the first historical reference to the Apostles' Creed is um, Ambrose, contemporary of Augustine, Ambrose of Milan, wrote a letter that we know the letter was written in 389 AD. And in that letter, Ambrose refers to the Apostles' Creed as having, um, having, having been around for a long time. So we don't know exactly w- when, but, but we know that by 389, it had been around for a long time. You know what it says? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Fifth clause, he descended into hell. That's 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19, possibly. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven. That's 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, amen. To understand the phrase, the holy Catholic church, is a simple, uh, like, historical Lego set. The Apostles' Creed was written before Rome began claiming its primacy. So it's not using Catholic in the sense of RCC, it's using Catholic in the sense of universal, every nation and tribe and tongue. But the other line in the Apostles' Creed that's disputed is what does it mean that after he was buried, he descended to hell? Maybe referring to texts like this that's, that we're open to this morning in 1 Peter chapter 3. That Christ's death on the, after his death on the cross, he went, verse 19, and proclaimed to the spirits in prison his victory. I don't believe that 1 Peter 3 or the Apostles' Creed means that Christ's death on the cross was almost enough, but then he had to suffer in hell for two or three days, and then it was really enough. That's not what it means. He descended to hell, if that's, if that's what he did, to declare his victory, to proclaim his victory and come back to earth for then 40 years, I'm sorry, 40 days in, 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 to appear with his apostles, and then his ascension which is also mentioned here in the end of 1 Peter 3. So what is this, what is the upshot of this for you if preaching is meant to give you encouragement through instruction in the truth? The upshot for you, just like the original people that Peter was writing to, is this. The whole world might turn against you because of Jesus Christ, but you will never lose because Jesus Christ is victorious. That's the upshot. He was victorious on the cross. He is victorious over the powers under the earth and he is victorious of the powers on the earth. So don't let them intimidate you. Don't let them shut you up. Don't let them tempt you to compromise into sin. Keep all your hope in Jesus because he is, he is victorious and he's ruling and he's reigning. The upshot of this practically is the world is going to make being a true follower of Jesus costly and the world is going to tempt you to compromise or the world is going to seem like it's on fire and it's going to tempt you to panic. Here's an upshot for that in a year as crazy as 2024. When you are tempted to panic, remember, Jesus Christ isn't waiting to reign. Jesus Christ is reigning. And it didn't even take him three days in hell after his death on the cross. Upon his death, when he yelled out, Tetelestai, it is finished, he immediately began to proclaim his victory to, to, to the fallen angelic powers underneath the earth. So don't be afraid of any power on, on earth or from hell if you belong to Jesus Christ. That's the encouraging upshot of this first question that we ask out of verses 19 and 20. The second question we can ask from verses 20 and 21, what does Noah and the ark have to do with this? Verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Church, don't miss the word eight. I, this is so good. Don't miss the word eight. One time I was talking to a, a hostile unbeliever and he was like, you, you can't possibly believe that God put Noah, you know, and giraffes and stuff in a boat and then, and then, and, 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 and then destroyed the world. You know how the world just uh, doesn't want to believe and sort of every now and then mocks us for believing supernatural or miraculous things? Not only do I believe that the story of Noah and the ark is literally, fundamentally, scientifically, historically true, but the authors of the New Testament believed that it was so true that they could put in the specific word, Eight. 
eight, not seven, not nine. It, the, the Bible's not just like a general outline where we get to fill in the details. The Bible is so specifically detailed in its claims to the truth. And church, we have to hold on to that. This, I think this is part of Peter's burden. It's why he said in the previous paragraph, you know, be ready to answer when they ask you for a reason for the hope that is within you. I think, I think sometimes instead of answering the world's questions, we need to object to the world's questions and bring it back around to say, you know, the fact that you're asking that question in the way that you're asking it shows that you are already viewing life upside down and not right side up. In other words, in other words, the, 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 the way to do biblical apologetics isn't to sort of, sort of start in a hole that the secular culture dug for us, like the Bible's old and inaccurate and we have to prove it. No, the, no actually, actually, the worldly way of thinking is new and untried and untrustworthy. The biblical way of thinking is old and trustworthy and tried and true. So just open it up and share it. Don't get misled by all sorts of distracting little mazes that the world makes up in its, in its small mindedness. So I love that word eight. It's so accurate. But why does, why does Peter bring up Noah and the ark? Well, the contrast with Noah, of course, is fitting because Noah and his family of seven plus him were suffering we could say that they were a minority in a majority culture. If the minority is eight and the majority is, oh, I don't know, the entire world population minus eight, we could say that they were a minority in a majority culture. And Peter is preaching to a church that is quickly becoming a minority in a majority culture. And I am preaching to a Christian church that is, Christian-wise, a minority in a majority non-Christian culture. And Peter's audience and my current, the folks who are with me here in this room now, in some ways will suffer because of that. So the parallel between the situation in Noah's day and the situation in Peter's day is clear on uh, uh, at least three, at least four levels. First, it's the minority majority thing that we talked about. Noah and his family were a minority surrounded by hostile unbelievers. That's the first way that it's a parallel. The second way that it's a parallel is that it is righteous and wicked. It, the text says that Noah was righteous, but the world was wicked. It says that in Genesis 6. It says it when the New Testament repeats the story a couple of times. So it's the minority majority uh, Line And then secondly, it's the, that Noah was righteous in the midst of a wicked world, which fits with why, why Peter said that, uh, that in verse 14 of our same chapter, even if you suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. Verse 15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make an offense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that even when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We're a minority in a majority culture. We're righteous in a wicked culture. A third parallel is that we witness in a culture that's hostile and hateful toward us. Noah witnessed boldly to the world around him, even though the world was hostile and mocked him. That's a, that's a parallel to Peter's situation, and it's a parallel to our situation. And then a fourth parallel is simply the word judgment. Noah realized that the judgment was coming. In chapter four, the very next chapter, Peter's gonna talk about the day of judgment a couple of times. He's going to say that God, in verse four, he's going to say God is ready to judge the living and the dead. In verse seven of chapter four, he's going to say the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober-minded and be ready. No one knew that judgment was coming. We know that judgment is coming. So if that parallel fits, then what's the upshot for us? If preaching is the presentation of biblical information for the purpose of encouragement, what, how is it that this parallel with Noah helps us and encourages us in our situation? Well, just because all of the world is drifting into sin is no reason, church, for you to compromise with sin or drift into sin yourself. 
because judgment is coming. And just as Noah stood righteous in a wicked and perverse generation, I'm I'm pleading with you and exhorting you to stand righteously in a wicked and perverse generation. Don't drift into sin just because everyone around you is drifting into sin. And don't become subtly like the majority just because everyone thinks a certain way, talks a certain way, panics about certain things, doesn't mean that God's church thinks that way or talks that way or panics that way. We have confidence in Almighty God and we walk in righteousness as his children. If that's a second question we can ask, then let's ask a third interpretive question of verse 21 and the question would be this. What does Peter mean about baptism when he mentions it? Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Notice the word baptism, verse 21, comes after the word brought safely through water, verse 20. Don't disconnect those. There's there's no verse numeration the way Peter originally wrote it. So he's talking about the, the ark and Noah being kept safe in the water. And then he says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And I hope you can see the parallel there. The waters in Genesis 6 were the means of the destruction of the world. And yet the waters, Genesis 6, remember Noah was building that ark out of gopher wood and building that ark and building that ark and it was just sitting there. But it was the waters that destroyed the world that did what to the ark? Lifted it up, buoyed it up, buoyed it up so that Noah and his children could be saved. And he's saying just like that, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt, but as an appeal to God. Peter's argument is one of typology. In, the, in studying the Bible, we have types, and then we have what could be called an anti-type or a fulfillment of the type. And it, I'm not making this up out of my mind. I know that ESV translates... Uh, Uh, verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this. ESV translates the Greek word corresponds, corresponds, but you know what the Greek word is? Anti-type. That's, that, it's just an anti-type, it's just a transliteration into the English of the Greek. So a type is a picture, like a, like a a picture ahead of time. And then an anti-type is the full, like, truth, that that picture ahead of time corresponds to. That's why corresponding to is is an okay interpretive translation of the word in verse eight. So the original type is a figure and then the fulfillment we see in the antitype. The original type is a picture, but what it points to is the antitype. So how does it work? Well, the flood is the initial picture. Christian baptism is the ultimate, the, the antitype that it's pointing forward to. Because the waters of baptism symbolize death as well as the, the new life. We baptize by immersion. We remember that Jesus Christ was buried in the tomb and then he rose again. We, we remember that Jesus Christ died for our sin, that we who live may no longer live to sin, but live in Christ who died and rose again for us. The flood waters prefigure that. The waters of the flood, uh, you know, you know they, they, they killed the world. Anyone submerged under water for too long dies. And when Paul says in Romans 6, He's talking about being dead to sin and alive to God. And he's talking about baptism in that very same context. But what does Peter mean when he says baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you? Well, it's, it's almost as if, or scratch the word almost. It, it is that I think Peter knew that Maybe somebody would get misled by this. And so as soon as he says what he says, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, then he goes, I don't mean 
the removal of dirt from your body. But what I do mean is an appeal to God for a good conscience. You see what, you see what he's saying there? He's saying, don't misunderstand this. Uh, it, it's not just the physical ceremony in a body that saves you. It is the authentic by faith appeal to God for a clean conscience by believing in this cleansing power of the blood of Jesus in his death and resurrection. That's what he's getting at. We could paraphrase it, baptism now saves you. Not the outward physical ceremony, but the inward spiritual reality which that ceremony represents. When Peter says not, and then he gives those, those additional explanatory words, he's guarding against any sort of magical view of baptism that attributes saving power to the act itself, ir, uh, irrespective of the reality of faith. Baptism saves because it is a, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is that Jesus Christ saves, that God the Father saves through Jesus Christ. A religious ritual doesn't save, but Jesus saves. And baptism properly understood represents my union with Christ, my union with Christ, my faith in Jesus Christ, my, 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 my resting in what Jesus Christ has done for me in dying on the cross, being buried, and then rising again. That's why when we bury someone, we, or that's why when we baptize someone, we use those words from Romans chapter six, buried with him in death, to walk with him now in newness of life, from Romans six, verses one through five. If these are the questions, and I hope that you can see how answering these questions not only provides interpretation and teaching, but provides a, a, an encouragement and an exhortation, Perhaps the last question we could ask out of verse 22 is, what is the primary point here? And we've already touched on it, haven't we? The point is that verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins, but now, verse 22, he is ruling and reigning forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Christ's ultimate victory is the most precious encouragement that I could ever have, that you could ever have. If I'm going through a hard thing in church, a hard relationship or a hard shepherding issue and, and it starts going well, then I get happy and I, I get encouraged and that's a natural human reaction to things going well. But if I'm going through a difficult shepherding situation in church and it doesn't get any better, I can still have an encouragement that isn't related to things getting better right away, but that is related to the fact that I know that Jesus Christ rules all things and he rules all things well. And this situation that I'm in is not outside of his sovereign purview. And I can trust him with it. I can trust him with it. Christ's ultimate victory and sovereignty and authority is the most precious encouragement and assurance for every believer. Preaching is for the purpose of encouraging you, that is giving you courage through biblical instruction. And the main point of this paragraph, 18 through 22, is that believers need not fear the demonic powers below. And believers need not buckle under to the power of Caesar or the president and vice president on the earth. Because Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been once for all subjected to him. You can be sure that just like Noah plus his seven, the future of you and yours who are in Christ, the future of Racine Bible Church is secure now in time, and most certainly forever when the judgment comes. Peter is celebrating Christ's rule and reign and authority even while Christians are being threatened with imprisonment and financial loss and even worse. He's celebrating Christ's rule because Christ's resurrection means the power of sin and the power of death to intimidate me has been taken away. Christ's ascension 
means that I belong in heaven and after a little while of suffering, he's gonna conclude the letter by saying, after you've suffered a little while, Christ will appear and you'll be with him forever. And Christ's ascension proves that, that I belong where he is and after a little while, I will be where he is. He was enthroned and he ascended in our human nature yet without sin, proving that we belong there because our elder brother, the last Adam, he went there for us as our forerunner. Jesus Christ is on the throne of the universe and he holds the keys of death and hell and his word is absolute and he has the name which is above every name. So there is no earthly name that would cause the Christian to compromise and quake in fear. We can resist sin, we can refuse to compromise, and we can joyfully stand up for Jesus as a minority church in a majority world because of the hope of resurrection and because of the sure and certain reign of Jesus Christ who is in heaven and who has all powers and authorities subjected to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, hear your children as they pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you and we say, hallowed be your name. That name which is above every name. That name to which every power under the earth and on the earth is subjected. We declare your rule and your reign and we rest in it. And Lord Jesus, we lift up to you the temporal troubles and the difficult situations that we face in life and ministry. Oh, they are many. And sometimes they keep us awake at night. Sometimes they cause us to wonder and to fear. But we place each and every one of these in your hands, knowing that the hands that we place them into are the hands that belong to the head of of the church, the head of the universe, before whom every authority bows and every tongue confesses that you are Lord, that you are right, that you are worthy, that you are good. Lord Jesus, we bless your name for being so trustworthy. We confess our listlessness, and how quickly, like a, like a reed shaking in the wind, we turn to earthly trust. We repent of that, and we ask that you and you alone would be our trust and our stay forever and forever. Lord Jesus, strengthen your church by the preaching and application of your word. Amen. To find out more about our ministry, contact us at racinebible.org. Thank you for listening.